Welcome to the Ignited Recovery Podcast, a new way forward for anyone looking for answers but feeling left out. If you've been searching for empowerment, triumph, and purpose, you've found them right here. You won't hear the same solutions and you're not going to have any excuses to fall back on because Ignited Recovery allows heroes to rise and become their best selves. I'm Dr. Adi Jaffe, and I can't wait to be your guide on this journey. Are you ready to become an Ignited Hero? Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Ignited Recovery Secrets Podcast. We've got a really inspirational visit from somebody who's now a really good friend, Um, Charles, Charlie, Charlie Rocket, CEO Charlie, uh, whatever you want to call him. Charlie Jabley is uh, he's not he's not a normal guy and you're going to see that in this interview you know when we talk so often on this um, on this podcast when I when I speak in other social media channels etc um, so often we focus on problems and how to resolve problems and what I love about talking to Charlie is that it's almost like he doesn't see the world that way I mean there there aren't going to be that many people who live a life and have lived a life that is so all over the place as Charlie and yet somehow can figure out a way to, um, to pull a common thread through all of that. Um, Charlie's struggles have been with food, food addiction, and, you know, and really being healthy. And it's going to be, you're going to hear some things that you never would have probably expected to hear on this podcast in this story. Like, uh, I never thought we'd have the manager of two chains on this podcast. Uh, and yet here we are. And I never thought that the manager of two chains, um, would, would end up running a, an iron man as a way to prove that he can lose over a hundred pounds. Like it's just, there's so many aspects of the story, um, that are going to shock you, are going to make you inspired. And I hope more than anything else are going to show you that there's a completely different way to look at everything. Because you're going to see that Charlie doesn't look at things the way a lot of us do, a lot of the rest of us. And it's amazing the kind of success and the kind of strength you can have to weather so many different, not just storms, but so many different situations and, and endeavors in life when you just adjust your perspective. Um, You're going to love this one. I want to remind you that it really helps us and it'll help you and your friends if you screenshot as you're listening to this, when you get to a moment that is inspiring and helpful to you, screenshot it, write out the little quote, tag me at Dr. D. Jaffe and at Ignited. Um, Tag Sophie, tag Charlie at Charlie Rocket um, and and let's get this conversation going. Let's create a difference in people's lives. Let's make sure that these stories don't stay locked away with the whatever it is now, 10, 15,000 of you who are listening to each of our episodes, but instead get out into the world so we can make a difference in other people who are struggling and suffering. You know them. You might be one of them. Let's get some help. Thank you all so much. Get ready for Charlie Rocket. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a ride. All right, everybody, welcome to our conversation part of the day. I love it when we bring you people who are not kind of like the stereotypical guests we have. And I don't think there's a way to describe you, Charlie, other than that. But I I guess kind of almost anywhere you sit, you're not a stereotypical guest anybody's had on. So that's probably not really hard. That's a compliment. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely a compliment. And uh, we've got... There's so much alliteration in the name that you've had up to now. So you start out as CEO, Charlie. That's right. And now you switch to Charlie, Charlie Rocket. Rocket. And um, and your story is one of I mean, We talk about transformation a lot on Ignited. Mm-hmm. But your story is of massive transformations multiple times in your life. So why don't you tell, introduce yourself to everybody. Tell us how you got to sitting on this couch right here. And uh, we'll go from there. So yeah, man, thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, I'm excited to talk about this because when you do interviews and you're able to go deep, it allows me to talk about things I, I, I don't usually talk about. Yeah. Um, if I were to describe myself first first and foremost, I would describe myself as a, as a child. Mm. Um, I think it's my gift. 
I'm 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 a delusional optimist, like a <laughs> like a child, like oh yeah, that's going to be easy, or oh let's do this, it. let's let's do that, you know, like there's no excitement, there, there's no measuring stick of what you can do. There's uh, before, you know, so, so society tells you what's realistic. We just have ideas and imagination, and um, I lost that for a while. Mm. Um, going back to when I was eight years old, I mean, my dream was to be an athlete. Okay. You know, it's one of those, you know, things that are just installed in you. But I was chubby. I'm still chubby. But I was chubby as a kid. And I wanted to be an athlete. But I looked around at school, and this guy is good at basketball. That guy's good at football. I need something to be good at. Buried the dream. Mm. I, I've always had the gift of seeing around the corner. Okay. So I said, okay, being an entrepreneur is going to be really, really cool. I came up with a name for myself. And anytime I want to attract something into my life, I give it a name. I give it an outfit. That's almost like being a WWE wrestler. I love it. You take on a persona. <laughs> 100%. And then it becomes you. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to be CEO Charlie. And I would have all sorts of businesses. And anytime a friend asked me, Charlie, did you, uh, have you ever seen the movie Super Bad? I said, I was too busy cutting grass. Like I was always, that's like my way of hustling. saying I was working. You were hustling. It was fun to me. Yeah. And it wasn't about the money that was fun. It was about beating my high score. All I wanted to do was beat my high score. It's like if you played a video game or played a basketball game and there was no score, it wouldn't be fun. So I was like, wow, like like uh, in kindergarten, I remember uh, we had a little bank account thing set up. And we would uh, bring our money to school on a Wednesday and we would hand it with our little ledger to our teacher. And every time you made a deposit, you would get a sticker to put on your crown box. And I immediately went into vision <laughs> mode. I said, I'm going to have more stickers than anybody. Oh, that yeah. was my mission. And I put the stickers all on the outside, and then I started putting them on the inside, and I filled up the outside and the inside, and then I started carrying a second crown box. Well, you got to have room for more stickers. Bingo. So that was like the birth of just me wanting to beat my high scores. And I that's, love it. That, I would lose the stickers. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I love the difference. It's so cool. So you got, you got your second crayon box, and you collected in that. It was a precursor of what was to come in my life. And that was that was at a very young age. And as I got older, I got into music. And I, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. My mom sold vacuum cleaners. Huh. My dad sold vacuum cleaners. Mm. My grandfather sold vacuum cleaners Damn. since 1952. Did you bring one today? Or we, we got, <laughs> we, no vacuum cleaners today. No vacuum cleaners. How did you get into music? Atlanta, Georgia is the home of hip hop. Mm. And as me as an entrepreneur... I'm like, I see my friends rapping. I see all these, you know, it's it's just, it's what you're around. I'm like, I want to be great at this. I want to, I want to start a website and I want to, I want to get a camera and I'm going to start shooting music videos. Okay. Websites started taking off. Record labels were calling me wanting to purchase the website. And then one What was the website called? It's called spityogame.com. Spit your game. I, I got it from Biggie Smalls when he says, uh, spit your game, talk your shit. And I was I like, love, spit your Biggie. game. So I um I built the website. It blew up. And I'm in college. I'm not exactly making money from it. I'm in college. And I had just registered for my uh, classes. And my mom, she's tough on me. She's, you, she said, uh, if you're in college, uh, you got to, you got to, one, you got to pay for it yourself. So mm. you got to work. It was just like when I was younger and I wanted Allen Iverson shoes or Jordan shoes. She says, no, you got to pay for it. I love it. She was always tough on me. So paid for college. But she also taught you how to, how to get your own shit. Definitely. So you didn't, you didn't have to mooch off of other people. Exactly. Because growing up, I mean, we were, uh, I wouldn't say poor, but my parents were extreme with money. Um, they they never made more than $40,000 a year combined. Uh, mm. We lived in an old house built in uh, like 1918. And in the wintertime, basically, uh, you could feel the wind coming through the windows. Wow. The, it was so old. Yeah. And my dad, like he, he had financial goals. 
He wanted to buy real estate, buy rental properties with every penny they made. So we didn't have heat in the wintertime. He like it was it was he set up a fan system off of the wood burning stove in the living room, and he would he would have these ducts going all on the floors of the house with fans inside of them, blowing the heat from the fireplace to other parts of the house. Basically, so that was a hustler too, though he he just knew how to make stuff work. That's right. And I would be so cold when I would change my clothes. I would change under uh, in my bed. Uh, eight quilts on on my bed, and oh it would be the only God, place man. I was warm enough to take my clothes off. And uh. then I got smart, and I was like, "Okay, let's change in the shower. Like we're going to turn it on, and that's going to be my heat." Because your dad system. had, because your dad had locked that yeah. down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that it ultimately taught me about money and yeah. being frugal. And when I got into hip hop and became extremely successful with winning Grammys and world tours and those things, I was frugal through that process, mm. uh, and that's what allowed me when I wanted to re invent my life so it allowed me to be able to walk away from my business so let's i mean i want to talk about the reinvention but i want people to really understand so you got into music you started this website you're in college you're enrolling in classes things are blowing up but it's not like you're getting paid yet that's right so what allowed you because to get to the transformation you did a lot of work before you needed to transform Mm -hmm. what made the guy charlie in college ceo charlie owns this website what made you start becoming a real entrepreneur where you're, you got multiple businesses, you're repping all these people, all that? So that day I registered for my classes in college, I got a phone call from Interscope Records the same day. And they said, we want you to go on tour with this new artist we just signed named Soldier Boy and do his viral work, be his cameraman, his editor, do all his digital marketing. Soldier think- Boy up in it. <laughs> I had to I had to tell my mom that I want to mm. drop out of school. So so I drove home. Ooh, that's not a call. Oh, you <laughs> drove home to say it in person. Oh yeah. Uh, I I lived at home. I lived in my mom's basement at the time. And I drove home and I said, "Ma, I got a call. They want me to go on tour with a rapper all across the country." And immediately in her mind, she's thinking groupies. And she's thinking uh-huh. all this. It's the exact opposite of what like college and then tour with big rapper i'm gonna be responsible get a job you know pay for my own college oh hold up that's not exactly what i'm gonna do instead for the next year i'm gonna go hang out with some rappers on the road exactly and there was there was there was two other times in my life i had to convince my mother of some really extreme things so i had a little bit of practice (laughs) okay the first one. You know, I'm going to want to hear about those other things, but uh, but go uh, ahead. Uh, the first one is when I was uh, 12 years old. I um I was suing this guy by the name of Jason for a saxophone I sold him, and he stopped paying me. I made a contract with these payment plans. At 12 years old, you made a contract. I made a contract. All right, so you're not a normal human being. Oh no! It's <laughs> it, it just made sense to me that we needed it. a piece of paper no, that no, said you were going to pay me. I had a, I had somebody sitting on that couch earlier today who's a client of mine, who like at the age of thirty five hasn't figured out that he's got to make contracts with people. <laughs> he's doing business. You're doing this at twelve. So he stopped paying me for the saxophone. So I'm going to sue him in local, you know, small claims court. Sure. And he didn't show up. So I feel like screwed out of it. Don't know what to do. He's not answering my phone calls. It's for 700 bucks. To me, it was a lot of money. 700 bucks when you're 12 years old is like the moon. (laughs) So I got a letter in the mail. This FedEx. I've never gotten like a FedEx letter in the mail. And uh, I opened it up and it was this beautiful letter. And it said, we want to invite you to New York. We saw your court case. We want to make, we want to get you paid for your saxophone, but it was from Judge Hatchet. No a way. TV. And I'm 12. I'm like, oh, we're going to New York. We're going to be on TV. And I'm like looking at my mom and dad like, let's, let's go. Let's do this. Let's and get in the car right now. <laughs> and they're like, Charlie, that is a white trash television. We are not. And I was dead set on it. I was, there's no way we're not going to be on TV. I was so excited. So I had to actually convince my parents who are very just conservative, classy, sure. not in the spotlight, you know, to, to go take me to New York and be on television. Now, for people who don't know, because they've never got, kind of gone through this, 
I assume like most shows like this, they say, we'll cover your hotel. Mm-hmm. Like, we'll take care of you over there. We just want to make a point of this kid being robbed of his 700 bucks by this dude who bought his saxophone. That's right. And the, uh, and Jason agreed to it. The guy who I was suing, he, they already sent him the letter and agreed to it. So he wouldn't have to pay because they would pay his side as well. He wouldn't have to pay me. I love that he wouldn't respond to you. <laughs> but he would respond to a TV show asking for him to show up. That's amazing. So that was the first time I had to convince my mom of something crazy. Did you do it? Oh, yeah. I did right. it. The footage exists somewhere Shut in my mom's basement. Up. Wait, is it online somewhere? No. It Dang. will be one day. Maybe right. when I release my book, I'll, I'll release the footage. If anybody listening right now can find this stuff <laughs> or has a recording of like all Judge Hatchet shows... Please let us know and we'll put a link up to it. Oh, no. The second time also involved New York. I'm, I'm 15 years old. New York's got a thing for you, man. It does. It, it, it really does. And I had a business partner. I'm online. I'm doing online e-commerce business. And, and there was this kid who was just like me, 15 years old, lived in New York. And we had a business going. And we were making some money. Yeah. We were making some good money in high school. And um, I, said, I said to my mom, I want to go visit my business partner in New York. She's like, you have a business partner? I said, yeah. She said, well, what's his name? I said, his name is Khan. But no, 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 C-O-N, K-H-A-N. That's his real name. She's like, well, well, tell me about his parents. I said, well, does he live with them? I said, no, he has his own place in Brooklyn. She said, how old is he? He's 15. And I'm like set on um, my like this is my business partner this is our business like i remember like banging on the bathroom door as my dad is taking a number two like dad dad like this is when i first started the business with con what's your social security number he said why i said i need to open up a paypal account he said what's paypal i said i said it's this thing where you could send money through the internet he said you can't send money through the internet. Oh. Like, that's not how money works. I said, he's like, you need it my does social. indeed. <laughs> so it's like, I'm having to educate my father oh. of what PayPal is. And then this is a legitimate thing. And he was so skeptical. So me and Con, we have the business. I convinced my mom to allow me to fly by myself to New York. What were you guys selling? Uh, we were selling clothing. Okay. with was sports memorabilia. And we were doing good. Google AdWords was brand new. Yeah. We could buy the number one. So it was like listing. eBay, where you buy stuff on eBay and then reselling it or no, Khan actually had a supplier because he was in New York. He was in a big city. So he had a supplier who we could get this stuff wholesale from. Oh, wow. And then we were selling it. And AdWords was brand new. We could get the number one listing on Google for 20 cents a click. Like wow. it was like just perfect timing. My mom had stipulations though on allowing me to go to New York. She said there's a vacuum cleaner salesman. Of course, I love it. Who, who has to be your chaperone. Your parents are like, yo, here's our business. We got to work this out. And she said, there's a, there's, a, there's a little nun hostel, a hostel run by nuns in the Chelsea neighborhood that you have to stay at. And they're going to supervise you. Wow. And I was like, whatever. Right? I'm going to New York. Totally. I remember I had my I had my iPod shelf. I was wearing it like it was a, like a, a jewelry pendant. I was wearing it around my neck. And I'm getting on the plane. And I'm listening to Gucci Man. So icy. I'm so icy. All the, and it's just like, I'm just like, I'm grown. I'm 15, but I'm grown. I'm going to New York, the big city. Wow. And uh, me and Khan, we had we had a great business. And uh, he also, when we built the website, built it with him. The business we split, and, and the business kicksonfire.com is the biggest sneaker blog in the world today. Mm. And um, I, uh, I took the spitcher game. I took the music side. He took uh. the sneaker side. And um, anyways... Here I am having to convince my mom to go on tour with Soldier Boy. She says yes. We've got uh, we've wow. got a pattern going here to where I'm yeah, able yeah, to convince her to yeah. do crazy things. I go on tour on top of the world six months later. And Soldier Boy was crazy back then. Number one artist in yeah. the world. I mean, Number he, had, one he album. had his own dance. Yeah. When you got your own dance, you made it. Oh, for sure. And um, there was one day we were going to Jimmy Kimmel. And something was kind of getting funny with the management and Soldier Boy. Mm. I knew the next day we had to be at the airport in the morning because we're flying to the West Coast. And I didn't get the itinerary. So I just show up at the airport just waiting. I'm calling everybody. Nobody's answering. Me and Soldier Boy's DJ 
uh, we're in the same boat. Like nobody's answering the calls. So we're standing at the airport and it just hit me after about two hours. I think we're fired. They just dropped you. They didn't even communicate. Didn't say nothing. Just like we've been on the road for six months. And then one day or two days, the communication stops. I got fired. And I went back home to my mom's house. I'm living in the basement. I'm off tour. So I got to go back to living in the basement. Because you weren't making $50,000 a week being on tour with Soldier Boy. Not as a cameraman. Uh -uh. Right, totally. So I said to my mom, I said, I think I'm fired. But don't worry. Because I know where the money is now. I'm going to be a manager. She looked at me. She said, boy, what do you know about managing a hip-hop artist? I said, I don't know anything. I'm 18 years old. I don't know anything, but I'm going to figure it out. And uh, I learned that from vacuum cleaner sales. If you're, um, if you're seems- knocking on somebody's door and they invite you in the home and they ask you a question. You got to figure it out. I said, I don't know the answer, but let me find out for you. Yeah. And I told that to my mom and I said, I'm going to be the biggest, best manager in the world. I found this girl group who to me was going to be the next outcast. They were girls. They were rap and sing and they were dope. And I sent them to Interscope Records. Interscope Records signed them immediately. I'm seeing my future. I'm about to be like, when you get a record deal, like you're on top of the world. Yeah. Get them on television, 106 and Park, radio, features, music videos. And then one day, was in Washington, D.C. doing a show, and they started acting funny. The girls. The girls and their moms mm. acting real funny. And, you know, when somebody's uh, mad at you for no reason, there's something else going on. They're looking for something to be mad at. They said to me, you didn't get us water when we got off stage. And I'm thinking to myself, I got you a record deal. I got you the show. Like, I got you on television. And you're mad about water? Oh, something funny is going on. Yeah. And there was this guy who was in their ear. Ended up, I got fired. Back to my mom's basement. They Damn. Said, they left me for Sierra's manager, big industry manager. And they were like, well, we can't have an 18, 19-year-old manager. You know, we're big now. So I'm right back, mom's basement. And uh, I had kind of got caught up in the hype of everything. I what was, is happening to you? I'm wondering as you're going through all this, because before you were all on your own, like businesses, you're starting on your own, mm-hmm. maybe business partners, but kind of like these little these little projects. And now you run into an industry mm-hmm. and this is the second time. Because like here, you're telling the story in 30 minutes, but this is months every time and relationships and handholding. I mean, to get a group from Atlanta that nobody's heard of to even get a deal and then get on TV. There's so much coaching and so much handholding and, and hugging and crying and running and yelling and screaming that happens there. And I'm sure the same thing happened with soldier boy, right? Going mm-hmm. from him, like starting on a little bit on tour and then he's blowing up and getting bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. What's going on in your head? Cause you seem like a really resourceful guy, but I think what's interesting here is what made you get up after each one of these things? What way did you go? Well, these people screwed me. I got to figure out what happened there so I can not, not do it next time. And then these people screw me like, what's going on for you as you're trying to understand how you're going to make it better next time? There's two things. One is being a delusional optimist is literally, uh, it's like drinking your own Kool-Aid. Yeah. Ship is sinking. Oh, we're good. That lifeboat is just as good as the big old ship. Like yeah. literally like, oh yeah, I'm going to be dry on the big ship. I'm going to be dry on the little boat. All good. It's all we're good. So I'm literally almost delusional, but I'm choosing what I'm going to look at. Okay. Like I have this little life hack that I do every day. I said, oh, I'm on a winning streak. And I, I go to Starbucks, right? And I, I buy, a, I buy a, a little latte or a tea and it's $2.65. And I tell the cashier, I say, all that happiness for $2? That's amazing. Like I'm on a winning streak because that's going to make me more happy now than I was before I drank it. This is a big win. I like I'm on a winning streak. So I'm looking for all the wins. And the second thing I did and, and it was very uh, specific to this time in my life. Yeah. I read a book from Barry Gordy called To Be Loved. Who's a huge manager by himself. Yeah. The 
biggest, Barry Gordy was the biggest independent record label of all time, made more number one hits than the big record labels, Motown Records. And I read in his book that every artist left him except two. He had hundreds, and everybody left and would try to come back. They would left, they would be disloyal. Stevie Wonder, little Stevie Wonder at the time, and Smokey Robinson were mm. the only two that were loyal. And that taught me, oh, oh this yeah. is just how it is. Yeah, I just need to find my two that are going to be loyal, and there's going to be a numbers game. You know what I think is huge about that, that I don't want to, I want to make sure it doesn't pass over people's heads, is there's always pain, there's always suffering, there's always struggle, shit's always going to go wrong. You can choose to focus on that, right? You mm-hmm. can choose to wake up in the morning and go, fuck, this didn't work out yesterday and this didn't work out. I'm stressed out about this other thing that's happening right. today. I got this thing in three weeks. I can't, pl- I don't know mm-hmm. how I'm going to get there. You can choose to focus on that. Yes. Or you can choose to focus on what's good. Yes. And what's hard about that, based on what you were just saying, which I think is, again, I want to make sure people get, even if there's only a little bit good going on, mm-hmm. even if you got one artist, mm-hmm. right? You don't know if that's your next Stevie Wonder. Mm -hmm. That thing right there could be the end of everything you're looking for. It could be the start of a brand new life. Mm -hmm. But if Barry Gordy or anybody who's successful ever would choose to only focus on everything that's not working out, then you're not putting the right focus. You're not paying attention. You're not doing your best for the things that are working. Mm -hmm. And then they're not going to work out. They're just not going to. Like, I mean, you know, I'm sure we'll talk, there'll be more stories like this, but for all the artists you're talking about, it's the same shit. If you think about it, they mm-hmm. make hundreds of songs and they hope like two of them ever hit. Exactly. Because they're going to make track after track after track, album after album. I actually have some album. data on that oh. from my artist. Okay. And it's, it's, it's very synchronized with my life. Now we know my name is Charlie Rocket and we'll get to it later yeah, yeah. of how we got that name. Notice everybody, we're not at the transformation yet. This is just Charlie <laughs> becoming Charlie. How many miles is it to outer space? Out of like the end of the atmosphere? Yes. I don't know, like 300 miles? I have no idea. Only 62. Okay. All right. And if we look at a rocket at the beginning, the first mile is using up more energy and gasoline than the whole rest of the trip combined. It is very hard to get off the ground. Momentum. And I was fascinated by this number 62. And I was like, huh, I wonder if this has a pattern in my life. Because when you get to outer space, it's fast and easy. You're flying. Yeah. Yeah. I went back and counted how many songs 2 Chains had to release before he had his first number one hit. And I went and counted them all. Let me guess. Is it 62? 61. <gasps> so the 62nd Hold one on. was a hit. Hold on. But my first group, um, who we haven't gotten to in the story, their name is Travis Porter. I know it's a group named after one person, whatever. But they were from the east side of Atlanta, and we released 64 songs before we had our first number one hit. Okay. So it's a pattern that I saw. It's all right there. And I call it like this law of 62. Like if you, uh, say you're a YouTube content creator or a podcast and you're that consistent, I don't know, maybe it's just in my life. If I were to start a podcast, I'm guessing episode 62 would go viral. You know what we got to do now though? Uh Uh-oh. We got to release this to 62. I think we're only on like 57. Ooh. Ooh, my man, Law so we of 62. Got, we got we to gotta make be. 62 play out right here. <laughs> All right. I think we're literally on like 55 or 56 has been scheduled. So we got to right. make this one 62. Can't wait, brother. Can't wait. So maybe it'll come out on January 1st when people need a good transformation story. I love it. All right. So here we are, Travis Porter. I, I, I got fired from the girl group back in my basement. That delusional optimism sets in and I, I, I read the book. I realized, oh, this is normal. Oh, yeah, people are supposed to leave me. I put my suit back on. I said, I'm going to be CEO Charlie again, and I'm not going to get distracted by hip hop, and I'm never going to tell people my age. I said, this time, we're not signing a record deal. We're not doing it. I didn't want the artist's heads to blow up too big. Yep. And I would drive around. We started knowing the game. You, You learned the game. I would drive from every radio station, from Jackson, Mississippi, to Washington, D.C., to promote our songs. I would pass out hundreds of thousands of CDs outside of clubs at 4 o'clock in the morning every single night to promote our songs. I would go on MySpace and get carpal tunnel syndrome. I would do eight hours of commenting every day to promote our songs. And we took three records, 
top 20 in the country without a record deal. Is this Travis Porter? Travis Porter. All right. And that allowed me to discover an artist by the name of Titty Boy. Titty Boy, for the people don't know, who don't know, is named Two Chains. Two Chains, his first name, he was in a group. He was signed to Ludacris for 10 years. Really? And in the South, in the deep, deep Luda South. Luda. Yeah, Luda. Is the man. Oh, yeah. And in the deep South, if your name is uh, Titty Boy, it means you're a mama's boy. So that's what his mom always called him. His mom called him Titty Boy. And that became his rapper name. And I said, we got to change this. Me and my business partners, we shook it up. We reinvented him. Uh, we got him out of his deal with Ludacris. And... um we, we've won Grammys and world tours and things of that sort, but there was one problem with business. If we rewind to when I was eight, what was my dream? Eight? When an athlete. Eight. You want to be an athlete. And I buried that life purpose to do something that I was good at, but maybe not what my life purpose was. Yeah. And business became a trap for me. Three things that caged me in. One. Stress leads to food. Deal making leads to food. And celebration leads to food. Was there a lot of alcohol involved too or not so much? I've actually never drank. Okay. Never drank, never smoked. Okay. Um, I was surrounded by it. Because for a lot of other people, there's a lot of smoking and a lot of drinking along with that eating. That's right. But you didn't have those things, so food played even a more important role for you. That was my addiction, Okay, was food. And everything about business led me to it. And uh, Was it always a celebration or did it become a way for you to deal with the stress? Well, food naturally is uh, how you celebrate. So when you're stressed, you want to associate with your thing that you celebrate with. So it gives you that happiness in the moment because it reminds you of celebration and uh, deal making just by itself is oh we're going out for lunch dinner or- and you don't and you don't celebrate with like a seared tuna salad no you don't see that a lot right mm-hmm. like you don't go to a restaurant you're like we just closed a record deal bring us Caesar salads all around mm-hmm. it's not that no. it's like steak and pasta mm-hmm. and and yeah. all that stuff for me it was always desserts well was it desserts always the now, sugar got you I got to a point where dieting became. It was, it was every day of my life. I'm very, um, I'm very um, motivated. So I've never had a day where I wasn't like, oh, wake up in the morning. This is the day. We're going to lose weight. Every single day of my mm-hmm. life is wake up and do it. And when It's got to be debilitatingly annoying, though, after a couple of years. Oh, man. From age eight to, mm. you know, now. I mean, I'm still, I still deal with it. But with me... The, 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 the mindset of dieting was tough because I was always told to eat less. So if I were to tell you to uh, breathe less in the next three minutes, you would be able to do it. But then after a couple minutes, you would then go. <laughs> the scarcity rule, man. That's right. When, when somebody tells you you can't have something, it all immediately elevates in terms of its value mm. and your desire for it. That's right. And I was always told, don't eat carbs, don't eat sugars, you know. So when I would binge eat and it became an addiction, I would first I would like mess up like, OK, like, you know, stressful day, boom, mess up a little bit. Then I'd beat myself up after the little. Uh. So I tripped down one step and then I would be like, OK, tomorrow I'm going to get focused. So let me just go ahead and push myself down all the rest of the steps today. Because I want to make myself so sick that I don't even want to ever mess up again. I would basically attempt to overdose on food. Mm. And I would do a tour. It was a gas station tour. Now, when I would binge eat, it would never be in public. I would never go to a restaurant. I have to be in my car. This is so similar to people who'd sit around their room and drink all night, you know, or people who go in their house and go smoke their drugs or whatever, Mm -hmm. right? It's like... It becomes your defense, your safe space almost. That's right. I, uh, I remember one day I was um, my best friend. Uh, her name's Tasia. And um, she texts me. She said, where are you? I was like, I'm at the office. And I was lying to her. Uh-huh. I was on one of my tours, my gas station tours. And I explained the gas station tour. This gas station has the Krispy Kreme donuts. 
And I would go to this other gas station because they would have the Mrs. Field cookies. And then I would go to the drive-thru at uh, Wendy's because I really just want to make myself sick at this point. So I'm going to get a Baconator and a, and a Frosty. And then I would go to another gas station just to push it all the way over the edge and get a whole bunch of pastries. And I would go from each one. It would take me maybe about an hour. I would eat in my car. And so my best friend texts me. She said, where are you? I was like, I'm at the office. And she said, okay. And um, I was actually at this gas station right near the house. She was my roommate. She lived with me. And I see a black Dodge Charger <laughs> pull up. She's in it. And I didn't know if it was, there's a lot of black Chargers out there in the world. <laughs> you in Atlanta? I'm in Atlanta. And it pulls up and parks right beside me. And I was like, oh, well, it could be anybody. But I'm afraid it's her. And I'm sitting there stuffing my face with a Baconator. And I look over to the left, the window goes down, and she's looking right at me. I have tinted windows. And then, so she's just staring at me. She can't see me, but she's staring at me, and she knows it's me. You know, she knows my car. And I roll down the window, and I was like, okay, you caught me, but it's just those sad moments of addiction. Yeah. And other times, it would be like in the house. I guarantee, by the way, that everybody listening right now can relate to times where where they felt so lost that lying about anything didn't matter anymore because they just mm -hmm. needed to be left alone mm -hmm. in their misery, right? It sucks. Everything sucks. The world sucks. You, you don't see it going anywhere. I mean, you're pretty, it sounds like you're a pretty optimistic guy, but in those moments, it's like you just need to get to tomorrow. You just, like today is ruined and the you just have to get optimism would actually it. play against me in times like this because a part of the binge eating was optimistic. Oh, Tomorrow is the day. So I'm just going to go ahead and ruin it today because tomorrow is going to be the day. So me being optimistic would like, I would actually make today worse because tomorrow I know I'm going to be so focused and I want to be even more focused. So let me like make myself sick tonight. And I could almost see just based on who you are, where... You're normally so optimistic and so just success driven mm -hmm. that it's like that's perfect. That's right. That's your ideal. And then if it goes off, you don't. You maybe it's different now, but you didn't have a lot of like middle areas. There wasn't a lot of gray space. It was mm -hmm. either a perfect day or oh. it got ruined already. Exactly, one hundred percent. And I think life for a lot of people that struggle with addiction at any point is actually lived more in the middle. But we fail, we fail to recognize it for so long because mm. we'll go, if it's your gambling addict, it's like you're in the hole, you're in the hole, you're in the hole. Mm. You're trying to go for that million dollar win. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get there, then it's your failure. Right. And so you're sitting there and this, your, your roommate is sitting next to you and that's when it all hits because somebody else is watching it. But you've already been in that place for hours. Yeah, man. So it would be... It'd be times like that. And, 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 and another thing I've actually never told anybody that, you know, when you're addicted to food, one, it's the, maybe the worst thing to be addicted to in my mind because you needed to live. Yeah. Um, it, it sucked that that is the thing I was addicted to. Um, and in, in hip hop, um, I've had artists, um, artists that I manage personally get killed. Um, I've been shot at. Mm. Um, I've had, you know, two chains has been shot at. Um, my artist that got killed, his name is Bankroll Fresh. I have another artist who's very hot right now named Young Dolph. He's been shot at over a hundred times. <sighs> One time here in LA, shot four times at the side of Lowe's Hotel. And my family, they would watch the news reports and things like that, and they would get concerned about me. And yes, hip hop has a lot of violence, and I've been through it all. I didn't choose it. I was just a young entrepreneur who loved music. Yeah. But this was attracted to us. And I always I always told my family, I said, you don't have anything to worry about. I'll be fine. And then I thought about it as I'm 305 pounds. I did a simple Google search. I said, how many deaths a year are there by guns? 22,000 a year. I said, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. And then I said, how many deaths a year are from cardiovascular disease? Way more than 22,000. 600,000. And I told my family, I said, you ain't got nothing to worry about with hip hop. There's more violence going on in our kitchens across America mm. than hip hop ever could be. 
Yeah. There's so much violence. There's so many people dying from food. And food would kill me long before a gun would. Right. I'm mm. there 305 pounds. What year is this? This is a year and a half ago. Wow, man. 305 pounds. Do we need to pause? Okay. I'm at 305 pounds diagnosed with a brain tumor. We had just won a Grammy. With two chains? With two chains. And I didn't even want to go to the Grammys. I, di- I actually didn't go to the Grammys. I was so fed up with my life. I knew everything had to change. When you win a Grammy, which is the most prestigious award, yeah. and everything we've been working towards for the past 12 years, and we finally got one, and I didn't even want to celebrate. I didn't even want to go. I knew I had to reinvent my whole life. You just got diagnosed with the tumor? Yeah. How'd well, you, I had I had been diagnosed with the okay. tumor when I was a, when I was in high school. Oh, but it had been in It remission. was under control. And then my body got out of whack. All the unhealthy eating. All the stress, all that. And it started growing and the medication wasn't working anymore. So it was benign sitting 100%. there for a while and now it was growing. Yes. And were you were you feeling effects from it? Was it Oh. Okay. I was at Two Chains' house. I woke up one morning. And first, the first thing that happened, and I never experienced this, is the room was just spinning and I couldn't stop it. Wow. I'm conscious of it. I'm like, the room is spinning. I wonder how long this is going to go on for. This is in the back of your head is the tumor? Pituitary gland. Oh, okay. I got out, it stopped. I got out of bed, went to pick up some socks, passed out, gone. Woke up. I don't know how long I was gone. Woke up. Walked downstairs, told Two Chains something's wrong with me. And a couple of days later, I called my mom, said, I need you to come in town. I didn't tell her what was going on. I just needed to be around her. Flew her into LA, and something told me to watch a documentary. Mm. Something in my gut told me that what I'm consuming is my problem. Because uh. when I was first diagnosed with my brain tumor, was in high school. I would eat lunch. And then these migraine headaches would go off in my head. I'm talking debilitating migraine yeah, yeah. headaches to where I'd have to go home, get underneath the bed, surround the, the underneath of the bed with pillows so it's blacked out, no sound, no light, and I'd have to ride it out for about two or three hours. But it would be right after lunch. Brain tumor is under control, but here I am, my heaviest weight, as unhealthy as I've ever been in my life. And something told me that food is triggering something, some yeah. imbalance in my body of the hormones. The pituitary gland is hormones. So sure. I watched the documentary and immediately I just flipped a switch. I said, I'm going vegan. You know, I just, I'm from the what South. What was the documentary? Uh, Forks Over Knives. Okay. I'm going vegan. I'm from the South. Vegans are weird. You know, I'm from no hip hop. Vegans are really weird. You know, like in the South, you you don't hear of anybody being vegan. You know, that's a California. They're definitely not thing. out. <laughs> They're yeah. definitely not talking about it publicly. Exactly. So here I am. But you went straight vegan. It wasn't even like gluten free or any of that. You went straight vegan. I just flipped the switch. I'm going all the way. I said because in my gut, and people Literally. ask me, um, do you, uh, are you? Was it hard going vegan? Nope. I want to live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want to live. You know, when I first went vegan, full disclosure, I gained about 20 pounds. I was so unhealthy. I had no idea what I was doing. I thought, oh, I can go eat a veggie grill and French fries and all the unhealthy stuff. I was like, there's no way I can, you know, gain weight if I'm vegan. Oh, I managed to gain plenty of weight. <laughs> and then then I, 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 I got fed up. I was very depressed. Um, and I'm sitting on a beach just in Malibu, just in my journal, trying to figure life out. It was like eight hours. And I said, I need something that makes sense. I need something that makes sense. If I'm dying and you are what you eat, is what I'm eating dead or alive? Mm. And I never heard anybody explain this to me before. I just needed something simple. So then I would look at, let's say, something healthy like a cliff Bar. And... I, uh, that can sit on the shelf for four years. Is yeah. that dead or alive? Okay, that's dead to yeah, me. Yeah, no doubt. And then I look at like, let's say a, an orange. Well, that's alive. 
I want to be full of energy. I want to be full of life. So I need to eat life. I need to eat energy. You ever heard somebody say, oh, man, you're glowing. You know, I get that a lot now because everything I eat is glowing. Yeah. So that's what ultimately changed my life. I lost 130 pounds. My brain tumor started shrinking. And I did an Ironman in New Zealand. I biked across America. This is all this year. And I did the Chicago Marathon. I've done five marathons total. This is in one and a half years. The the bike across America, the 130 pounds, and the Ironman was all in the past year. That's pretty incredible, man. Thank you, man. Um, so you flip a switch. Yeah. But you still have to figure some stuff out because it's not like you knew what to do right from the beginning. It's not like you... Um, just because you figured out I got to go vegan and not eat animal products anymore, that the way you ate was good. I, you know, you're talking about kind of starting to eat things that are alive because mm -hmm. their energy is different. Um, it kind of made sense to you. What, what did you do? What were you reading? What were you paying attention to? Who were you listening to at the time to try to, I mean, that's a pretty uncharted territory for you to go into this place. I actually did the opposite. Okay. I didn't, I didn't read. I didn't listen. I got rid of everything. My life, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, um, as we go on in life, we, 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 we pick up all this baggage that becomes, um, like habits and just, it just piles on the older we get and we become more creatures of habits into certain things. And I said, in order for me to reinvent my life and to save myself, I need to get rid of everything. Mm. I need to literally start over and go back to eight year old Charlie where I got off track. What was my dream? First and foremost, I wanted to be an athlete. So I said, okay, if becoming CEO Charlie worked, I gave myself a name, I gave myself an outfit, and I showed up. I said, how can I do that with being an athlete? Okay, I'm 305 pounds. I put on my sunglasses with my Charlie Rocket bandana and my colorful clothes, and I gave myself a name, Charlie Rocket. I gave myself an outfit, and I remember when I went to my business partners, went to 2 Chains, and I said, I want to walk away from the business. They thought I was a little crazy. They said, well, what do you want to do, Charlie? I said, I want to be an athlete. He said, well, what does that mean? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> I'm going to be fine. Delusional optimism. Yeah. I have no idea how this is going to work out. I got rid of my business. I got rid of me. I got rid of dairy. I left Atlanta. I came out to California. I got rid of social media. I got rid of television. I got rid of everything, and I wanted to strip down to that eight-year-old dream before society tells you what's realistic and all those things, and I said, I'm going to be an athlete, I'm going to do this Ironman, and people told me, Charlie, set more realistic goals for yourself, you're just going to disappoint yourself, and I wasn't hearing it. I was going to do this Ironman and lose this weight. I walked away from the business, and it worked out. I became a Nike athlete this year. Congratulations, um, man. It's it's incredible that Nike would even consider a common man athlete, you know, who's not fit. I'm still about 40 pounds overweight. Hey, man, you know what? We live in the U.S. If if your story can get more people to give up, because there's a lot of people addicted to food. Seven out of 10 are overweight or obese. So, I mean, common man athlete, maybe, but we're not all going to be NFL stars. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can get guys were 300 pounds to end up being able to run a marathon or, you know, five mm -hmm. uh, and do an Ironman. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many lives we save, but yeah, probably a couple of hundred thousand a year. That's right. And, and I, um, I was actually in the Colin Kaepernick commercial, the big controversial commercial. Yeah, Nike, yeah, sure. Nike featured me in that ad and they actually named that commercial after me. So I have a tagline called Dream Crazy. I made a fan-made Nike commercial called Dream Crazy. And uh, that's what they titled the, the Colin Kaepernick ad after. That's so it's, awesome, man. It's just been a, it's been a crazy year. And um, I'm excited about the future. Yeah. Woo! So 
I found out about you because you wrote out this little post about like mm-hmm. kind of essentially saying nobody's listening. <laughs> I mean, if we're, if we're, if we yeah. break it down into two words, yeah. Uh, nobody's listening, right? Mm-hmm. Like I got a message, I'm doing change. And that's by the way, after all the success, right? Cause this is just like a couple weeks ago. So that's after the Nike ad, that's after doing the bike across America. That's after the, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then one of our listeners tagged me and said, in a, in a post with you and said, hey, talk to these guys. And so I reached out. Yeah. And that's where I love the power of social media. Mm-hmm. It's like this wonderful equalizer. Yeah. Um, where we never had that before, right? Like when you when you got started, you had to start this website and have all this huge success for Interscope to connect with you. Now it's like mm-hmm. somebody talks to you and, and here we are. Mm-hmm. Um, so A, I love that. That's why it's so beautiful to have a platform and have fans because... You never know who they'll connect you with, right? Now we're connected through this yeah. and we get to talk about food addiction, which is something a lot of people I work with struggle with, but there aren't that many people that are willing to come out and say, look at where it took me. Mm-hmm. And then I have to do a complete transformation. Mm-hmm. I just did an episode on this podcast a couple of weeks ago that said, to stop being an addict, you have to become the person who isn't addicted. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially what you just talked about. Yeah, is you had to become a different person. You had to literally change your name, mm-hmm. literally change the way you thought of how you're going to dress every day. Yeah, eliminate your old life and create a new one. And you seem to have this talent for being able to do that at the flick of a switch. Whereas for other people, sometimes it mm-hmm. it takes some time to to process right. that. Um, you said that before this crazy optimism of yours is a uh, delusion mm-hmm. delusionary optimist kind of thing mm-hmm. has served you but also hurt you in other ways like when you were binging because it was always there was always tomorrow mm-hmm. i'm wondering as you're living this new life it's only been a year and a half man that's amazing and the stuff you've achieved in a year and a half um what are you waking up for now what is that optimist in you because it's not barry gordon anymore it's not about managing people what is the optimism around now and what are you trying to achieve? So what I'm optimistic about moving forward is modeled a lot like the music industry. Mm. What, what fascinates me about artists, musicians, is they'll create something and then they'll go tell the world what they created. It's called a tour. Yeah. So for me this year, I lived, uh, uh, I, I lived, I lived something, and I created something, and I learned so many things from it. There were the ups and the downs. I still, I mean, we're, this is we're uh, fifty minutes into a conversation, but there's so much about like self love. We got time, man. Well, this isn't this isn't a rush. But I would love to talk about that. The yeah. self love and the self love and the depression, and because I still like people listening might be like, oh, Charlie has this whole thing figured out. Charlie does not have anything figured out. I'm glad you said that because none of us do. If you see my Instagram, I literally just like talk about what I deal with. And I never claim to be anybody's expert. I'm yeah. just not. I'm, I never say the words you should. For example, I teach through things I've experienced. And it's probably going to change. Like things I, I think are right today might change in a year or two. So... I'm fascinated by how the music industry works. They create something and then go on tour and t- teach everybody what they created. Yeah. So I, I had these missions. I biked across America this year. I experienced so much of other people's problems and my own problems. And I'm excited to go on tour and explain everything I've learned and what I'm experiencing in my life. And I want to teach people a way of life. By the, by the end of my life, I would love to have created something that goes on beyond me. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, ism, uh, like uh, let's say veganism, for example. Here I am on your podcast preaching about some ism that is a way of life that has improved my life. Um, or stoicism, like these things carry on. Sure. Way beyond. And I would love if I dedicated my entire life to figuring out what I did Mm. to improve and then package that in a way that can help somebody else improve. And maybe 2,000 years from now, 
people are still, you know, talking about it or making podcasts or things about this way of life that helped them improve. And I want to do these missions. Like this year, I, I lived a mission. And then next year, I want to go talk about it. Then the year after that, I want to go live a mission and then go talk about it, just like an artist would. Yeah. And next year, I plan on doing a lot of speaking. And I want to go be in front of 10,000 people a week. And I want to help tell their stories because I'm just one story. Sure. But there's going to be hundreds of thousands. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker as well. So I, I want to visually, and I believe stories are what helps people. There's, there's two types of way of helping people. There's the, you know, expert. Education, kind of expert thing, yeah. Very, you know, um, tactical, walk away with steps. Um, and then there's the... Um, storytelling. For example, there was a movie that changed my life called Moana. Have you seen it? I have. It's, I got kids. I've, I've seen it multiple times. And, and there was no how-to or self-help about that. But that movie was a girl on an island yeah. who was called to go save the world. And everybody was trying to hold her back. And she got up the guts to leave everything behind yep. and go on this journey. And then she went out, saved the world, then came back to the village and told her story. It's all superheroes are the same. It's the same thing. Yeah. But when I watched that, it made me cry. It made, I felt something. And I was like, wow, like I learned so much through a story that started a conversation in my heart where a lot of like data and information in is for head. our heads. Yeah. And I said, I want to talk to people's hearts. Maybe that's why I was put on this earth. Yeah. To talk to people's hearts. And yes, there are going to be things I learn and things, and I want to go share them and I want to tell stories. So speaking and going to schools and teaching uh, high school kids about, you know, obesity and saving them, telling them things that I just wish I had heard. Sure. And telling them the stories that are relatable, like telling, like uh, Duke, um, basketball team brought me in to speak to the players and the coaches they explained to the players oh be focused like don't be distracted da, da, da. i told them hip-hop stories of the same exact thing the coaches are saying right. but it, instead of saying don't be distracted i tell a story about drake i'm at his house yeah he's having a pool party Every distraction in the world you could ever imagine. But he's working. And he's in the pool house recording his album. Yeah. And I'm telling that to the Duke players, and they're like, wow, man, this is the coolest thing ever. But it was a story about distractions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a good point, kind of, I think, to, to get people to really understand that at the end it comes into work. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got to put in the work, right? Two chains, it sounds like, and I knew none of this before because I only knew him as two chains, but... That dude was working for 10 years before. Mm -hmm. It was an overnight success, right? Mm -hmm. He was a, he was one of those overnight successes. It just took 12 years to create an overnight success. Yeah. And um, But along the way, you got to do the work. The people that get overly distracted by all that stuff, mm -hmm. they just don't make it. They can be around it. If they're good enough, they might be around it. But the people who hit peaks are not the people who write. Look, we're in LA. It's, it's, uh, it's noon. Mm -hmm. Um. It's nice and sunny out. It's not super hot today, but I think it's going to get pretty warm, like high 70s, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, there are people freezing around the rest of the country right now. We could be at the beach. We'd be hanging out, maybe having a drink. Even I see people you don't drink, but I could, you know, it could be like one of those lunch mimosa mm -hmm. things that people do a lot of times. <laughs> but to get to the top, for sure, you got to put in the work, whether it's in success and money and hip hop and fame and that stuff, or in losing 130 pounds and Iron Man and marathons, right? You've spent this last year and a half working, working on yourself, not being distracted. In the face of all you talked about before we did this, you talked about New York and the media tour and stuff like that. And that happened even around this. Mm -hmm. But you that, that just becomes part of work. It's just the stuff you got to do. You know, um, I think too many people expect wrongfully that you hit some magic point. Because you talked earlier about it gets easier. Mm -hmm. And it does get easier, right? Like, yes, starting the momentum is the hardest part. Mm -hmm. But it still is work. Mm -hmm. Two, three, four, five years from now, for you, keeping healthy will be work. Right. It'll just be easier because you know what to do. Doing this mission will be work. Yeah. There'll be all these things. You just create 
that's why I that thing the idea is how do you transform your life so that the work is not extraordinarily difficult because it's all built into the way you live now mm-hmm. but you just become a different you literally just become a different human being almost and it seems like you managed doing that in like a year and a half which is pretty incredible thank you i think for a lot of people that transformation can take five to ten years sometimes to do it but you seem to have this resolve to just like wake up and go fuck it this is what we're doing today with losing weight having one foot in and one foot out um took me i mean it was my whole life and i could never get there and then that's why when i decided okay this is the time i got more done in 6 months than i had done in you know 12 years 15 years 20 years just because i i, I dedicated and i said this is just going to be a chapter yeah and yes there will be casualties there will be friends who like when they're calling me i said call me next year I'm I'm doing something right now. Yeah. Like, don't call me tomorrow. Like, literally, I have to get this done. Like, there's only one thing. And I've always been extreme. I've always been a man of extremes. Um, you Like, if I'm going to bike, I'm going to bike across America. If I'm going <laughs> to eat, I'm going to eat 15,000 calories. Um, if I'm going to do a business, I'm going to, you know, drive to every radio station. But I get more done by, you know what, let me eliminate. Like, right now. I'm struggling with my last 40 pounds. Yeah. It's been a tough year for me uh, through all the success that I never would have thought. I've always wanted to know what it's like to be fit. Like I saw you like run up those stairs a second ago. I'm like, man, this guy's like, he's, he's in shape. Like, but I've never taken my shirt off and liked what I saw in the mirror. Yeah. It's never, not one day in my life experienced what that's like. And yes, that's vanity. And, you know, I always heard people say, oh, you should love yourself for who you yeah, are. Yeah, by the way, I'm not hearing you saying like, you said like what I see in the mirror, not mm-hmm. I've never taken my shirt off and had like rock hard pecs and abs you can like mm-hmm. wash laundry on <laughs> right. or that. Like that to me is vanity. Right. Liking what you see in the mirror is just wanting to be happy in life. I think we all should deserve to s- simply like the mirror. Yeah. And I think psychologically and physically right Mm -hmm. so i want to see what i want to like what i see in the mirror and it sounds like and again not to take away from that optimism that i love that you have but it sounds like sometimes that optimism allowed you to live a life you're not really happy with Mm -hmm. just because you were so psychologically strong Mm -hmm. and you you kept being able to focus on what's positive and what happen here is you have to introduce a little bit of pain and discomfort Mm -hmm. yeah you might have been optimistic through it but you had to cut people out Mm -hmm. you had to cut bro i mean again something you described in three minutes but like not a lot of people would have an easy time going from managing and partnering up with one of the biggest rap artists in the game right now and just be just walking away because they got to do something yeah you know it's um a lot of people hedge their bets they kind of just go like well let me just tell two chains that I'm going to go work out more today. Mm-hmm. And you just went, you know, fuck it. Let me just go all in and do this. Cause when you do that, you know, you know how to win, yeah. but there's discomfort there. Cause you're walking away from a sure thing that's working now mm-hmm. into an unknown. Mm-hmm. You know? I've always been the king of putting the cart before the horse. <laughs> like it's like actually really, really far out in front of the horse. That yeah, we like gotta, the cart's two towns away. Exactly. And we got to go catch up to it. I actually like being in that position because it gives me, you know, a mission to wake up in the morning. Yeah. I just want people who are listening to kind of what I love about the story is you kind of, I'm going to make it all way oversimplified, but it's almost like you won twice. It's just what you realize after you won the first game was that that wasn't the game you wanted to win. Mm-hmm. You know, Jay-Z has this line in one of his songs, uh, nothing wrong with my aim, just got to change the target. Mm-hmm. And um, I like that. You, the skill set is the same skill set. Uh-huh. Like all my clients who got really good at hiding their weight or not caring about it or smoking weed all day and uh, hiding or watching porn all day in their room because they don't want to talk to girls because they don't know what's going to come at that. If they can put the same dedication into other endeavors, they'll also succeed at least at the same level. Mm -hmm. But it's the mindset switch that happens. Yeah. And for you, it sounds like watching a movie 
made you go, I think this is what's doing this. I think this is what's making me suffer. And a lot of us are looking for the thing that's going to make us flip that switch. What is the thing that's going to change our mindset? Yeah. One of the things I experienced this year um, was it was it was it was depression, um, which I've had on and off throughout my life. I'm not a depressed person, but there are times where like literally I see clouds, like dark clouds. Everything's dark. I can't yep. even see color. And it was uh, about a month and a half ago. I'm gearing up. I'm at I'm at the Chicago Marathon, and this was a big deal in my life because Nike. This is my, my dream company, the company I bought my first stock in when I was eight years old. You know, I now have a Nike deal. I'm in the Colin Kaepernick. They challenged me to qualify for the Boston Marathon. Mm. And it was this interesting concept. My heaviest weight was 305. In order to qualify for the Boston Marathon, you have to run a marathon in three hours and five minutes. Shut up. So it was like this beautiful I love these parallels, yeah. pain that they put together for me. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Like, I'm going to be fast. That's hardcore. For anybody who's listening right now, a marathon in three hours is sick. It is. All out sprint. All out sprint. So just picture you going outside on the street, <sighs> sprinting, to the, sprinting to the stop sign at the end of the street, but doing that for 26 Yeah, miles. like that's a speed I would run a 10K at. Mm -hmm. But you just got to go for the entire thing. That's right. So I optimistically said, of course, because this is going to be the one that gets me to my goal. If I can run that fast for that long, I'm going to get this weight off. Because, yes, I've lost 130 pounds, but the past nine months I've been the same exact weight. I did an Ironman, and when I did the Ironman, my weight loss stopped. And I was so confused. I thought when I got done with an Ironman, I would be so physically fit. But aren't you gaining muscle the whole time? Endurance sports actually doesn't. It okay. actually burns muscle. Okay. Um because you're 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 just you're using cardio, you're burning so many calories, you're not lifting weights. Yeah. Lifting weights gets the muscle going. Um what what uh endurance sports does is it really trains your nervous system to withstand um, and it does train the muscles, but you're, you're in cardio, your, your cardio, cardio your heart. So I'm doing an Ironman. I thought when I started this journey, I would be fit when I cross that finish line. I crossed the finish line and I celebrated because I did an Ironman, but I wasn't happy because it's like, uh, I'm still 40 pounds overweight. I still have rolls and I still have a chest. And as a man, having a chest is embarrassing. But I just carry my weight poorly. It's not loose skin. Some people think it's loose skin. I have fat that I need to lose. So when I kicked up the Ironman training, I had days where I would do three half Ironman in three days. So I'm like doing all this cardio and I'm not losing weight. So then I'm like, okay. I crossed the finish line in New Zealand at the Ironman. All right, uh, I need another big journey because when I get done with that, I'm going to be at my goal. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to bike across America. There's no way in hell if I bike across America, I'm not going to be fit. Well, biked across America, didn't lose a pound, still 40 pounds overweight. And the uh, audience might be thinking, oh, how's that possible? You must have been eating bad. I'll tell you what's going on after I get done with the story of self-love. But get done with the bike across America, still 40 pounds overweight. Nike challenges me to, to the marathon, Chicago yeah. Marathon for the 305. I'm training. I'm running fast. I'm in it. Boom, 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 boom. And then I get a leg injury. Calf injury. In the middle of the marathon? In the middle of training. Oh, wow. In the middle of training. So I'm about five or six weeks out, and I can't run. I'm down for three weeks. I didn't have a day to miss, and I missed 21. So I'm beating myself up. You know, I'm picturing all this hard work I have to do, and it's just I'm not at my goal, and I'm not going to be at my goal. And I, Nike, the pressure from Nike, you know, there I am in Chicago about to run the marathon. And I'm looking in the mirror in the morning and I'm like, another big accomplishment and yet I can't celebrate. Mm. 
I'm going to cross another finish line, and yet I'm looking in the mirror, and I still can't love what I see. And I said to myself, I need self-love in my life. I've never had it. I've never had self-love when I look in the mirror. There's plenty of other things I love about myself. But when I look in that mirror, I've never experienced what it's like to love myself. And I went back to the one thing I knew. If I want to be something, I have to give myself a name and I have to dress up as it. I was wearing a blue shirt and I hated the way I looked in it. I took the shirt off, looked in the mirror, and I told my best friend, Scott, give me a marker. And I said, I'm going to name myself self-love today. And I drew self-love all across my chest and stomach with all my imperfections. And when I went to go out and run that marathon, I took my shirt off. There's pictures of that on your, uh, on your Instagram if anybody wants to look at this. And when I took my shirt off, Within 10 seconds, somebody screamed at me, self-love. And I was like, whoa. And then hundreds and then thousands of people started screaming, self-love, self-love, self-love. And it was just, it was all these people were like looking at me, being inspired that it wasn't the normal like keep going guys you're doing right. great they're like looking at me and it's triggering something inside of them that is like so it's like almost i became their superhero and i wanted self love in my life and then everybody gave it to me because here i am with every one of my imperfections that i usually try to hide like right now i know the people can't see but i'm wearing a hoodie and a jacket right there's a reason why i wear a hoodie and a jacket on an 80 degree day it's because i literally hate that i have this and i can hide it with certain clothes yeah but i just want to know what it's like to be fit but when i ran an entire marathon in front of hundreds of thousands of people and they were loving my imperfections it gave me something I've never experienced before. The one thing I always tried to hide, when I just let it out and I wrote self-love on me and everybody is yelling at me, I believe energy is transferable. There was yeah. a lot of energy transferred yeah. to me on that day. And that was one of the, it, it got me out of the depression. Yeah. You know, in, um, in the book, I talk about three principles in recovery. And the first one is honest exploration, mm. knowing how you got here and where you are. Mm -hmm. And you seem pretty fucking good at that. The second one is radical acceptance, mm -hmm. which kind of seems like the piece you're talking about right now, right? Because the only reason we seek help, the only reason we seek change is because we've struggled, right? Like nobody goes through their day and it's going really, really well. And they go, I want to throw everything away and start from scratch. Mm -hmm. Nobody does that. It's mm -hmm. normally because there's a struggle going on. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately for a lot of people, when they try to create that change, they think they can run away from who they are to that moment. Mm. I don't think that's true. I think we have to get to that place we were looking for in that marathon and get really okay with who we are. Like so okay with who we are that we would be okay staying here because we understand it and we don't feel ashamed about it and we're not running away from it anymore. Mm -hmm. And once you get there, you now have the opportunity to decide if you really want to change it. Right. Because there's, a, let me ask you a question. I mean, the people I work with all the time struggle with getting better, right? You lost 130 pounds, man. Mm -hmm. Getting better, but then getting so dissatisfied with their better that their mm -hmm. entire rest of their lives become about making it perfect. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you a hard question. Mm -hmm. How would you see your success having moved from where you were before to what you're doing now and the change you're creating and this Nike and all that kind of stuff? This this fluctuation around this weight right now would be your life. Like how, what would it take for you right now to get proud and comfortable with Charlie the way he is right now in order to facilitate this next move? What would it take for me to be comfortable with the way I am right now? Yeah. There's only one thing. Okay. 
I believe that the universe is ever expanding. It means it's going somewhere. As long as I'm moving in the right direction, it, I have to be going with the current. Yeah. If I'm sitting still and the universe is expanding, I'm not expanding with it. Right. I feel a million times better about myself today if I just am going somewhere. I love it. I just can't be still and I can't be going upstream. I want to be going with the current. So it's like I could look at myself and if I, if I eat amazing today and I'm right on my diet, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I will look in the mirror tomorrow and be like, man, this ain't that bad because you're in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if this helps you for right now, but I can guarantee that there are people listening right now as they're hearing this and that this has helped them understand how to start creating the change in their life. Mm. And when I... When I work with people now, I always focus on purpose and contribution because there's a lot of other ways to measure how we're doing. How much money are you making? What car are you driving? How's mm -hmm. your career? How many friends do you have? How's your sex life? All that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's not important. It's important to be doing well on those elements. But I found that purpose and contribution are huge ways to measure how you're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, when you're clear, you, you're pretty clear on your purpose, where right? you've got that vision. Mm -hmm. I wonder if one of the ways that we got connected is to help on the contribution piece, mm -hmm. right? Like how do you take everything you've learned, all the changes you've created, and part of that expansion, part of that movement is in transferring it to other people. Exactly. Is in helping other people reach their potential. And I guarantee, we'll see it when this comes out, episode 62, um, when, when people write back and, and screenshot. So do me a favor, if you're listening right now, screenshot this thing, mm -hmm. tag Charlie, I can't believe you got at Charlie. Like, I don't even understand how that's a reality. It's crazy like, how it happened. I woke up one day and an employee at Instagram said, we've been holding on to this name. Shut up. You're helping so many people. We want to give it to you. And I'm just like, what was crazy was a week before I told my friend, uh, 2032, I think I'm going to run for president. <laughs> and I want to run on a first name basis. Just Charlie. I just went like Oprah, just first name basis. And a week later. You got Charlie. On the best social media platform. So in this the is going to be easy for you guys to tag because literally at Charlie is the dude I'm sitting across from. Um, tag him, tag me, Dr. D. Jaffe, tag Ignited. Um, and I want your takeaway. Like, what has been your number one takeaway from this episode? Because. You know, I could easily say if Charlie could do it, then then you guys can do it yourselves. And obviously that's true. But there's an inspirational piece to this about it doesn't matter where you are right now in your life. If you're unhappy there and you want something else, you can get it done. You can get it done. And um, maybe today wasn't a here's step one and here's step two and here's step three. But there are a lot of examples and everything that you gave around how to do this. I do have a step. You got a for step. People. Let's do it. There's a little hack I did that I learned through doing the Iron Man. And um, I shifted my thought process. And I never heard anybody prescribe this to me before. Okay. I said, this is going to be easy. Where usually when we're going into a diet or we're going into a business or we're going into an Iron Man. We're like, okay, this is going to be hard, Charlie. You know, you got to grind through the tough times because like, it's going to be hard. So you got to stay focused. I flipped it. I said, this is going to be easy. Yeah. I looked at an Iron Man training schedule and it had all this data of like, do this many sprints at this heart rate and this lap with this and that. Yep. And I'm just like, this is too complicated. That sounds hard. I looked at the bottom. I said, okay, how many hours a week is an Ironman training? That's all I need to know. Uh -huh. He said 14. I said, 14? That's two hours a day. That's easy. Because when I was eight, going around the park and running around for two hours, that's easy. That was fun. Or, or riding your bike with your friends on the weekend for a couple hours. That was easy. Or, oh, let's go to the pool and swim all day for a couple hours. That's easy. 
So I said, ha. I love it. I'm going to train like an eight-year-old, and I'm going to drink my Kool-Aid so much that even when it is hard, I'm still going to say, oh, th- th- it's easy. It's easy. I just got another hour running. Exactly. I did the whole Ironman with that mentality. Now, granted, I came in second to last place in the entire Ironman, but I did it. And Bro, finishing an Ironman, <laughs> period, I don't care how much time it takes, is ridiculous. 16 hours, 41 minutes. And the entire time, me and my best friend, Scott, we were smiling. We were the only ones wearing normal clothes. Like right. he was wearing cargo shorts. I was wearing like basketball shorts. Everybody else is wearing like their biker, sure, sure, sure. intimidating robot. Everybody looks like robots. I was like, I want to go have fun. We're dancing. We're like the people who did the Ironman race. They were like getting frustrated with us because like we're at the changing station about to transition into the bike portion. And me and Scott, like we're high five and everybody, they're like, you have to go. If you don't go now, you are going to get disqualified because you are within 15 minutes of cutoff. And I'm like, okay. And then we just like take off and we're just smiling. And we had the mentality of it was going to be easy. And when we got done, if you look at the finish line footage of me crossing the finish line at the Ironman after 16 hours and 41 minutes, we are smiling and we are happy. Yeah. The next day, like there was something <laughs> we did in our minds that was so powerful that the next day we weren't even sore. Wow. Never experienced that before. But we just always told ourselves this is going to be easy. I and love our it. bodies figured out some way of producing what it needed to produce to make it happen. I love it, man. I love that that's the one hack for this. Um, I cannot wait to hear the the takeaways from this for people. Please share them. Share them with us in DMs or whatever. Just let us know how this hit you. Thank you so much for showing up, yeah, man. man. Um, so, A, so proud of you. So incredibly um, excited to just see what you do with this next year, given what you did with the last one. Thank you, man. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We will see you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Ignited Heroes Recovery Podcast. I really hope you found the information here useful and that we'll see you back here next week. And look, I want to make sure that this podcast is the most useful it can be for you. So please let me know by emailing info at ignited.com if there are any specific topics or questions you'd like to have addressed. As usual, if you like this episode, I would love for you to leave us a five-star review and rating. Thanks, and see you next week.